Okay, so welcome to Retech, and today we're going to cover the Auric One. I did a little bit on the Auric One about five months ago. It doesn't seem that long, but there's been a lot going on in the world since then. And uh, taking a little bit of time to get the parts as well because of, you know, the current situation. And so it's kind of slowed down a little bit on that front, but I've got the parts that I need. So we're going to take another look at this machine and see if we can get it working. The machine itself has a fault um, basically as you saw before it won't power on or it's got corrupt display and it's something that really needs looking at okay um, I used a multimeter in the last one just to do some basic tests and we found out that this 6522 was the cause of the problem or at least we thought it was and that was using a basic multimeter so today we're going to take a step further not everyone's got access to oscilloscopes and so on so the original test with the multimeter, I wanted to find out if that was accurate enough for somebody to go ahead and replace the part based on a simple multimeter test. So we're going to do that today, have a look at it via a multimeter, find out what's going on and then hopefully get this machine up and running. Um, with a little bit of luck, um, we'll be able to do a little bit more on the Auric one once this machine's repaired. So let's take a look and find out if we can get another classic computer running okay so here's the auric one it's been a while since we had a look at this machine because um we've basically been preoccupied with things and also getting getting parts getting parts for one of these machines it's been a bit difficult and um one of the reasons is, is i was waiting for a 6522 um simply because it's causing problems on this machine or that's what i thought so what i'm going to do is we're going to check out where this these pins are for this 6522 and we're going to um find out what it does on the oscilloscope just to back up my initial theory that this was actually causing problems and as you can see there there is a a fudge that the factory did to get this um, machine working properly so there's um, a resistor across and what it's doing or, or what it appears to be doing is slowing down things a little so what I'm gonna do is um, check this um, processor out here and then we're gonna find out if I was correct in my initial diagnosis a little while ago by using a BOGO or a BOG standard multimeter, okay? First thing we're going to do is set up the oscilloscope. In the f uh, I'm going to use my uh, trusty old HP 1222A. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look for a square wave form on some of the pins on this board, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the probe here and then we're going to use it on the board right okay so the first thing you do is we find out we haven't got a, a square wave so it looks like this chip has a problem internally uh, because this should be putting out quite a square nice square wave but it's not and most of the other pins are just putting out static and we go back to the corrupt output pin and it's it's not very good it shouldn't be doing that so it looks like this processor is only reacting to static or, or a corrupt waveform so this this chip is actually dead and um, it's basically what the multimeter what the multimeter came up with um, just on a basic test that's what it should be and that's actually what it is so this is on a good chip which works fine and this is on the actual chip that we have here in the board and it's basically broken okay so if we look at the data sheet on this you can see there's um definitely square waves on the clock 
square waves on the output square waves everywhere for this machine which is how it should be and that chip doesn't have any form of square wave at all the only time you see it on the oscilloscope is when we use a brand new chip which we know is working so system clock timings output all square wave but it's quite not quite so clean when you see it on a oscilloscope but you can definitely see the pattern and on this chip we have nothing but corrupt static so we actually have a problem with that chip so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace it and to do this we're going to use this desoldering gun and we're going to use it on here to basically take away all of the solder on each of the pins okay so you've seen how um, the processor wasn't or the rather the chip wasn't working properly and some of you may have spotted that there was a few components missing out of the board on this oracle and that's because i kind of borrowed them um it's been kind of sitting around for five months waiting for the correct part to turn up and in the interim i actually needed a 6502 so didn't have one to hand and i couldn't be bothered to wait so I actually took it out of the board and used it and but now I have a replacement chip here which I'm going to pop in the board and also pop in the new component to replace the faulty one which you've seen in this video now with the data sheet on here if you follow it through and read through the data sheet on the chip concerned you will find there's a lot of information now easiest way to find out if a chip is dead if you do have access to an oscilloscope whether a handheld one or a vintage one like this is to look out for square wave patterns see most of the problem with these chips is that they start failing inside and all you do is either get a built-up of static or you actually just get nothing at all out of it you'll find that it's dead there's no output there's no nothing you'll just get a flat curve and that flat curve it really indicates that the chip is dead um, if you want to go into a little bit further and you want to delve in why is an interrupt not working or why is um, why does it crash on requests or whichever problem you have with it then I suggest you have a look at the data sheet and then drag out an oscilloscope and watch how the chip performs and you know most of the time if you have um, a multimeter and you check the voltages you can find that maybe it's not quite right and that's a huge indication that you have an issue with a component on a board so you know you don't need to go down the route of getting an oscilloscope you know just to get a feel or an idea of whether a component's failing or not voltages play really just as an important part so what we're going to do next is have a quick review of the machine and hopefully see it up and running okay so here we go so here we have an auric one it's not a massive machine by any stretch of the imagination and it's got a bit of an odd keyboard um the keyboard itself is bizarre in the extreme it's I don't really know how to describe it. It's it's like oversized calculator keys which have been kind of stapled on top of a flat piece of plastic. Um and it's the most awful thing to type on. Because I mean look at the gaps between the keys. You can lose your hands and your fingers in between the gaps they are huge I mean you got to think if these were three times the size they would still fit comfortably on this platform here so the keys are unbelievably small and I think that's where the Auric Atmos the next model after this improved a little bit because it was more of a standard keyboard in a very similar space even though the bottom and the base of the machine were almost identical. Now, 
it's not a bad looking machine it's quite striking and its main competitor was and probably still is this the um, ZX Spectrum and you can see the size difference the um, I mean this is still an inch or so a couple of centimeters gap at the back there's at least an inch or two centimeters at the sides and another centimeter along the bottom difference so there's a massive difference and I, I kind of think and you know this is going to kind of upset a lot of people I think um, the keyboard on the Spectrum is easier to use it feels a little nicer with the larger keys I mean the space bar is in the wrong place but you get used to that um, and it does feel a lot nicer than the Auric one um, but you know they were still learning at the time people really didn't know what to do and what to expect um, a home computer or a microcomputer to be because remember these are very very early now if you look at the back of the spectrum there isn't a lot on the back there's an edge connector an earphone and mic socket uh, an RF out and a power supply and that is it so it's not massively endowed with ports or user interfaces now as I say the, the Auric is undoubtedly a much better looking machine than most of the micros out there and its color scheme is quite pleasing really but that's not what makes the micro good or what even makes a micro because it's the ports on the back the expandability the usability as I said with the lack of ports on the spectrum in comparison to the Auric one I mean at first glance it doesn't look massively different you still have RF you also have cassette and RGB on here and it's a DIN socket for your cassette instead of your sort of old school ear and mic three and a half mil jacks and you've also got these as two separate connectors here you've got an expansion and printer Centronics printer interface which is arguably a brilliant addition when compared to most computers at the time or the lower end computers or the home computers where it didn't have an interface for a printer on and then you have your power supply but again not massively over engineered as far as ports go but you know it is a step up from a spectrum in that regard the other thing about the Oroquan is it has a full-size speaker it has quite a decent speaker in the machine and as you can see this one's a 48k model but it's not a bad bad machine overall so it'd be nice to um, get this machine up and running and then just give it a quick overview now one of the things you'll notice um, is that I never trust older power supplies especially ones that are kind of 30 odd plus years old so this um, machine has been treated to a brand new power supply and it also runs off of a SCART adapter as well which gives a much better quality picture especially if you're kind of in the European area um, you can also get RGB direct RGB leads because it's using the RGB port on the Auric one or you know you can use something else such as RGB to composite RGB to HDMI now so you can get all kinds of weird and wonderful adapters to help you out on your TV or on your modern TV so we're going to have a look at this screen now now as you can see when you've powered this on one of the nicer things about this is well originally it wasn't when I first saw an Auric one in action I thought oh it must be just black and white but it's not and one of the nicest things about this is actually in monochrome as you can see for your 
data entry or text entry as you would probably call it now and um, it's got 47k or just over 47 nearly 48k free which is a huge jump even when you consider that to a Commodore 64 and it's got Auric Extended Basic and it's got the original Auric 1 ROMs and you can get the Atmos ROMs on um, a few of these and it literally upgrades it to the, the next spec of Auric Atmos but you can hear an audible click when you press the keys which I don't think you actually need that because you know you know you've pressed the keys on this machine because not just the sound it makes is because it feels kind of clunky under your finger so you definitely know you've pressed them but one other thing is every now and again you will see this because the keys do stick a little bit which is annoying at times but it, it's not really much difference to the Timex Sinclair 2048 and so on because they too stick a little bit from time to time so we just delete this and it's got a, a version of extended basic in so if you type CLS it obviously comes up with a normal screen and it's um and not a bad version of basic and while we're on this subject this has almost certainly one of the better manuals basic manuals and it comes in this book and it's really good i mean it's a fantastic way to learn basic and it's a very well written manual and this this book even comes with a voucher for an Auric printer. Um, it's never been used. But the biggest thing about this book, as in this basic manual, is it walks you through everything that you would possibly need to know. And it doesn't do it in a childish manner like some of them did. Um, even though there are weird and wonderful illustrations but it's actually very very good now it is extended basic um it's kind of very very similar in its um some of its instruction sets to the tandy trs80 and dragon 32 because you have C load for cassette loads but the weirdest thing on this is you have actually got two speeds for um, loading you have slow mode I think it's around about 300 board and then fast load which is about three times faster um, and the way you do this is is type in this command for slow loading and then it'll run at 300 board I think the advantage of that is it's more reliable for loading and saving um, and it possibly you know gets rid of any tape errors because of slight variations in speed on the tape head etc so it's quite a handy thing to have and it made it a little bit more reliable but Auric were, were always hit and miss on loading even when they were brand new they would either load or not and it varied from machine to machine and I think that's was one of its bad points to be honest but um, it, it was a sign of the times I think you know this machine was ma originally manufactured and originally designed by a very established company um, which then branched out to be Auric okay so originally Tangerine Computers was a business orientated company and it basically built business orientated machines before it branched out into the more lucrative as they saw home market the other thing if we just delete this is it has a few other built-in functions which not many people know to you know to enable you to write your own games which is built-in sound zap ping 
explode. You know, all pretty kind of cheesy now to to a certain point, but you know, it's um it was quite good for the day because it made writing programs with even basic sounds a little easier and probably more interesting for your novice programmer. And you know, some of the commands were very similar to the ZX Spectrum, um, where you had border and paper and ink, and you have very much the same on this. And as you can see, it changes quite easily. And there we go. You can see how it's kind of very easy to stop producing colourful text and sounds on this machine, which was brilliant for a novice or somebody who was just into it. Um, so. This is just a very basic overview of the Auric one because um, this video would be getting quite a long video by now. So this is the basics of your Auric one, which then became on to become the Auric Atmos with an improved ROM and an improved instruction set. But they were basically the same machines. And you know, you know what, for all of its shortcomings and if it didn't have competition from this and this wasn't out as early as it was, the Auric one might have been a much more successful machine. It wasn't massively popular in the UK. It was a little bit more popular in parts of Europe, but it's now becoming a very, very rare machine and um, they need preserving. And if you do get hold of one, more than likely you're going to have to repair one of these because, because they are starting to fail with surprising regularity now. And there's, there aren't many that come up that are actually claimed to be working. Um, and even if they are working, they're probably not working 100% and you will have to do something to them. But it's a great addition to anybody's collection. So there we have a, a repair and overview of an Auric One. In the next episode about the Auric One, we're going to cover some more of its features, a lot more in depth and, um, you know, any upgrades that we could do for it or any special features that it has that it has over the other micros that were there. So in the near future, we're going to cover the Auric One a little bit more in depth. We're going to cover hopefully some of its peripherals, some of its software and some of its games. Um, and it was quite a decent machine for games as well. It, you know, even though it wasn't a massive seller, it did have quite a good selection of games. And it also had quite a good selection of peripherals, which hopefully we'll cover in the next episode on the Auric one. Okay, so thanks for that. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed that. As I say, it wasn't an in-depth look at how to repair an Auric one, but it was a, a little bit more of a view on you can fix these machines with basic tools and at the end of the day it's always worth having a go uh, especially if you have a dead machine and you've got the chance to put it right and a multimeter is good enough it will give you the basics and it will give you a little bit of a diagnostic tool to try and repair these machines the oscilloscope is backing up the multimeter in this case. So, you know, the, the square waveform that you're supposed to get on some of the output pins wasn't there. And really, the voltage on the multimeter kind of said that anyway. But it's nice to see it on screen. So we've got another Auric one working into the world and it's nice to save these machines. So. I hope you enjoyed this look at the Auric One and um, I hope you'll join us again for more classic computers, whether they're repaired or their history. And if you're into the history, have a look at our computer history series in our playlist. And it covers everything from Charles Babbage, hopefully through to the modern day. But so far we've got to the Wilkes, Hartree, Turing era. So I hope you'll join me very soon. I hope you subscribe. So please subscribe and we'll um, update you with the videos as they come out. And say so check out our history series. So thanks for watching. 
Thanks. Thanks.